Let me just start with you. Outline for us the state of the states, if you will. Yeah, so since 2016, states at least have learned that there are hackers trying to gain access to their voter registration networks, voting machines. They have an idea that there's something they should be looking for. Malicious actors are out there. But what they're having trouble with is necessarily gaining the resources necessary to gut their systems and uh, build the protections necessary to ensure that A, 2016-like hacks don't happen again in 2019 or 2020, and to know exactly what to look for that hasn't happened in the past. That's probably the biggest challenge. Larry, in your opinion, and through all of your uh, amazing uh, in, in work that you've done and the research that you've done, uh, what is the most vulnerable section for you when it comes to not only the election on Tuesday when we go local, but really going into 2020? Well, that, that's a difficult question to ask. I would say the big thing, um, because you know, so much of our elections is run on computers. Um, for me, the big thing is making sure uh, that uh, if there is a successful attack against uh, voting machines or the voter registration databases or the electronic poll books that we use, um, that uh, we have resiliency plans in place uh, so that even if a system goes down or if there's a problem with the systems, people can still vote. Uh, and we make sure that um, at the end of the day, those votes will get counted. So really what that means is making sure that uh, states and counties have enough resources um, to have backup um, uh, paper ballots, to have uh, paper backup poll books if they're using electronic poll books, which most states do at this time, uh, and they have the right procedures and training in place um, so that uh, even if something happens, and I think um, we have to assume the worst case scenario when you have nation state actors that uh, are potentially attacking um, you know, small uh, county election offices um, that were prepared uh, and people could still vote with confidence. Card K, are states getting enough help from the feds? The states will say absolutely not. They're doing the best that they can with the resources they've received. So uh, in 2018, Congress approved another $300 million that will be distributed to states and counties across the United States. $300 million across thousands of voting jurisdictions isn't that much. So so no, probably not. And Larry, I mean, what what really struck me in your report is of the $2 billion needed in the next five years, 40% of that needs to go with cybersecurity. Is that how the election hacking and election meddling is, is happening? Is it that cybersecurity weak point? Well, look, there's no question that our, our move to um, computerize our elections, which has a lot of benefits, uh, makes it a lot easier to vote, um, make sure that um, errors are caught, um, also comes with an additional risk. And I think uh, when we made that transition, and that really happened uh, in 2002 after the mess with uh, the hanging chads in Florida in the 2000 election, Congress passed this big package uh, to computerize everything from the machines um, to the voter registration databases. There wasn't enough planning about what that meant, that that meant that there had to be a consistent long-term investment. Just like we do in an office where we have IT staff and they're, they're constantly updating and upgrading, or your iPhone, it's the same thing um, with our election systems, and we really haven't invested in them that way. So, Carter K. Look, Tuesday are these local elections. Do you just assume there's nothing we can do? Uh, have we done anything since 2016? I think states have done quite a bit since 2016. The biggest change has been this push to get rid of um, the, the devices that you touch and result in, in a vote, right? You can still touch a screen and that'll be tabulated, but now there's in most places a paper trail where you can verify that the button you pressed is turning out the result that, that you're looking for. Also, tomorrow's gonna be a big test for those jurisdictions with new systems. These will be the first time that uh, a lot of these paper trails are going to be tested uh, in uh, jurisdictions that really lack IT support. Um, so they'll, they'll really have to figure out whether their auditing systems are up to the snuff in case there are malicious actors in their networks. Tomorrow's a big day. Uh, Larry, as we move on from Tuesday to 2020, mm -hmm. what is your biggest risk? Uh, well, again, look, I, I think one of the big things here, and Carter K mentioned this, um, we've got 8,000 separate election jurisdictions in the United States. Many of them have 
um, no IT support or cybersecurity staff. So getting those jurisdictions more resources um, so that they're prepared on election day is really critical. That means having um, extra cybersecurity staff, IT staff, uh, and, and as I said earlier, um, having backup plans in place, because um, you know there are problems in every election, no election is perfect. So having backup plans in place, whether it's because of malicious action or just because um, there are errors in the system um, so that people can vote and those votes get, get, get counted are really critical. Larry, I have to ask your thoughts on Facebook not fact-checking political ads. Uh, we could spend a long time talking about the issue about um, about fact-checking ads. That's a that's a difficult issue and conversation and a long conversation to have. I think what, one critical thing on this, I think, is that um, Mark Zuckerberg, when he says um, we're, we're, we just want everybody to see if uh, a candidate is lying and so we're going to put it up there, I, I do think that's a little bit disingenuous. Um, one of the problems in 2016 was that we didn't know about a lot of these ads. There's something called micro-targeting uh, so, that, so that ads can only go to a select number of people. Uh, so I do think that um, leaving the issue of, of fact-checking ads, um, passing, passing requirements for more transparency in these ads so that everybody can see them. There's something called the Honest Ads Act, which is a bipartisan bill that uh, Senators Klobuchar, uh, Graham, and Warner have sponsored, uh, is really critical. Um, and we had FEC uh, Chair uh, Weintraub, Ellen Weintraub, uh, have a, had an op-ed in, in the Washington Post, I think just yesterday, um, calling the, for the end of micro-targeting for these ads so that so that um, you, reach a, you could reach a particular geographic area just the way we do with television ads, but then everybody sees it as opposed to having these ads that um, a lot of people just don't even know about.